It's huge! <laughs> Snow, which part of this thing is the butt? Oh, it's all butt! Three decades. That's how long the Final Fantasy series has been going strong since its first game released on Famicom in Japan in 1987. Spawned during the era of Glasnost and Perestroika, it's amazing just how much staying power Final Fantasy has managed to attain through the years. From its scrappy days as the pet project of Hironobu Sakaguchi to the height of its fame as a global powerhouse in the mid to late 1990s, the Final Fantasy series has managed to outlast many world movements as well as popular games in an industry where today's hit is tomorrow's cancelled Hasbro. In its wake, the series has left a trail of beloved characters such as Cecil, Terra, and Cloud, as well as a host of fantastic monsters that are practically just as beloved by fans. It is that deep pool of heroes and monsters that now serves as the foundation for World of Final Fantasy, a celebration of nearly 30 years of Square's role-playing games. A cross between classic JRPGs and Nintendo's popular Pokemon franchise, World of Final Fantasy is a love letter to old school fans with a twist. In addition to its classic turn-based battle system and grand production values that the series is known for, the game also tries to bring in a new generation to the fold by adding a more childlike element in the form of monster collection and an art style that oozes with cuteness. It's an approach that certainly comes with its share of risk. While Kingdom Hearts character designs manage to just hit that ideal spot that's comfortable for both adults and younger kids, World of Final Fantasy's heavy use of scrunched up chibi characters in its game world can be potentially jarring to non-fans, as well as fans who are used to the more proportional aesthetic of later games in the series. Twins Lon and Rain are easily the most kid-friendly lead characters you'll see in a Final Fantasy game, spending the bulk of their time more like a Japanese manzai comedy duo that act as foils to each other. Underneath their comedic stylings and the game's lighter moments, however, is a story that hews to the familiar Final Fantasy formula especially as you enter the later parts of the game. After going through a cryptic beginning that's very much par for the course for a modern Final Fantasy or Kingdom Hearts game, you're reintroduced to the twins who have apparently forgotten their past. If you're unfamiliar with the genre, let's just say that amnesia is often the butter to JRPG's bread. <laughs> After being informed of their pedigree, the twins venture forth into the land of Grimoire to unravel the mysteries surrounding themselves while also battling a mysterious army bent on ruling the world. Visually, Grimoire's various locales are one of the game's big strengths. Square Enix has done a marvelous job in presenting a colorful and diverse world filled with lush fields, snow-covered mountains, burning volcanoes, and azure seas. It even has creepy haunted areas, making it a perfect modernized example of classic JRPG world design. The visuals serve as one of the main hooks for the game early on, as the plot and gameplay feature a notoriously slow start. While the areas look good, for example, the initial dungeons feature simple designs with little in the way of a challenge. Fortunately, you get to start capturing monsters right away, which accounts for the bulk of what you do in the beginning. Known as mirages in this game, the monsters can be captured by fulfilling certain parameters during battle. Some are as simple as whittling down a monster's health. Others, however, require tougher conditions such as hitting them with a certain element or status, or even healing them. Let's just say that I have never used the Libra spell as much in a Final Fantasy game, as Know Thine Enemy definitely holds true here. Once you fulfill the required conditions, the monster enters Prism Trinity status, which is denoted by a flashing circle underneath. You can then try to capture it with a specific prism that matches that monster, allowing you to add it to your team. On the plus side, the game gives you the requisite prism for free when encountering a new monster for the first time. Finding and capturing monsters is definitely one of the fun parts of the game. I can't even tell you how much time I spent not just finding mirages, but evolving them as well. To do that, you will need to level up each monster to gain ability points that you can then use to unlock various slots in their skill tree. It's pretty cool, for example, to capture a lowly copper gnome and transfigure it into a mithril giant, or a tiny white knack puppy that evolves into a Fenrir and then a gigantic Cerberus summon beast. If you're a fan of Final Fantasy monsters like Behemoths and Marlboros, or summons like Ifrit and Shiva, the ability to catch and command them is definitely a lot of fun. Some monsters can be captured earlier by entering Murkrips that contain tougher mirages. Also, while it can be tempting to wait and capture larger evolved versions of monsters later on, there's a benefit to getting those baby monsters to encounter first and then leveling them up. That's because abilities in baby skill trees are retained by their evolved forms, allowing you to use them even when the monster is transfigured. The only exception are field skills like Zap and Sizzle, which require you to devolve in order to use them. 
You can also switch easily between evolutions anytime once they're unlocked, so you don't need to worry about being locked into one form. Combat, meanwhile, uses familiar turn-based RPG conventions, with the addition of a new stacking mechanic. By mixing and matching monsters of different sizes with Rain and Lion's Giant or Lilikan forms, you can create character towers of up to three stacks for battling opponents. This is something you will want to take advantage of, as doing so combines their stats, including their hit points, defense, attacks, and special move bar. Certain stacks also unlock special combo attacks like the classic X-Slash or Cross-Slash, as well as fancy spells like Helldiver and Abaddon Flare. Stacking spells such as Fire, for example, also lets you use Fire, and can be further compounded to unlock Fire Raga, so it's a mechanic you will certainly want to take advantage of. At the same time, enemies can take advantage of stacking as well, so you'll definitely want to pay close attention. This can be especially tough early in the game when you aren't as powerful, including during boss fights, so you'll want to unstack foes when you can by using attacks with high topple ratings. Just keep in mind that foes can topple you as well, which makes you unable to move for a while and also lowers your defense. To counter that, you can either block, use an item that fixes wobbling, or unstack, then try to quickly stack back. When putting together your stacks, you'll also want to pick those that have good stability to make it harder to bring yourself down. The actual combat, meanwhile, is pretty basic, though you get more options later on once your characters become more agile. This especially helps with higher level mobs, as being able to move faster allows you to take advantage of blocking, which not only reduces damage but also helps you refill your special ability bar. By mixing specials, normal attacks, and blocks, you can take on the game's longer dungeons later on by keeping your life topped off and frequently replenishing your tiny special bar even when recovery points are few and far between. Another feature in battle are summons, which allow you to pack an extra punch against bosses. One way to access summons is by bringing an XL-sized monster, or extra large, <laughs> like Cerberus, which can stay on the field until it either dies or you run out of magic. Another is by acquiring the medals of classic Final Fantasy heroes, which you can then use to summon that hero on the field. Some specialize in attacks such as Tifa while also granting you a buff. Others can heal and even raise fallen allies back to life, so you'll want to have a diverse set ready to go depending on the situation, especially against bosses. As much as I enjoyed playing World of Final Fantasy, it does have its share of issues. Some involve little bugs like characters' tendency to repeat dialogue if you do something in the middle of the conversation, like check your menus for example. Others arise from game design choices, like the use of a fixed camera that prevents you from rotating the map, or the lack of a more streamlined way to check the status and abilities of your team and monsters without having to go through a bunch of menus. Personally, my biggest gripe involved the limited options on the field or during battle for changing mirages. There were a couple of times, for example, where I found myself faced with a switch that requires stacking monsters of a certain element and weight that I did not have with me, requiring me to backtrack a long way to access my reserve monsters. Sometimes I'm also faced with an obstacle that requires a field skill like Sizzle or Chill, which I might not have with me because I'm leveling up other monsters. Granted, you can use an item in the field to access your reserves, but it's quite expensive, especially in the early game, and it's a waste to use just because you forgot to bring a monster with Sizzle. Otherwise, you can bring a mix of monsters that have all the skills, but then you'd be locking yourself to a specific set of mirages, which takes away the fun of mixing and matching creatures on your team. This also can be an issue when trying to capture monsters, especially those that have special requirements like poison, for example. Sometimes you'll find yourself facing a monster that requires certain skills in order to trigger a prism tunity, and it so happens you don't have that monster on your active party. Such occasions can be a little bit annoying as you feel like you're wasting your time or missing an opportunity. Towns, meanwhile, while beautifully rendered, are also typically quite small, with little to offer as far as things to do. This makes them less memorable, and reduce them into places that you simply pass through instead of spending time in. Battling, on the other hand, places a strong emphasis on stacking, so you're spending most of your time fighting as a two-stack team. You can unstack into a six-member fighting group, but doing so greatly reduces your power and defense, even when using monsters with unstacked perks like Black Choco Chick. Also, while I appreciate the ability to battle with my own army of monsters, I also miss having a full party of actual characters that interact with each other. As it is, your party pretty much consists of just Lon, Rain, and Tama, which gets the old after a while. <laughs> This especially comes to mind when I'm interacting with classic characters such as Tifa or Titus. I always want to say Titus <laughs> during their brief appearances in this game. This also brings up the biggest weakness with the two-person team of Rain and Lon, as we're subjected to their specific personalities for the bulk of the game. While younger gamers will probably be amused with their conversations, they can come across as whining, which can grate on you by the time you've spent 30 hours or so on the game. 
It's not quite as bad as early Luke in Tales of the Abyss, but at least bratty Luke was surrounded by likable characters that added some diversity. Despite those issues, I like my time overall in World of Final Fantasy. As someone who played Final Fantasy games way back when character proportions were actually scrunched up, I can even appreciate the chibi look of the game's lilikins, though I wish they added the complete Japanese audio as well, and not just for battles. And as far as crossovers go, this one certainly has one of the better stories I've seen instead of the hodgepodge plot you see in games like Super Robot Wars or even Namco Cross Capcom. So time that? for my final thoughts. Overall, I think World of Final Fantasy is a nostalgia-filled love letter that celebrates three decades of Final Fantasy. Featuring wonderful visuals, classic turn-based fighting, plus cameos of beloved characters from series lore, the game hits a lot of the right spots for Final Fantasy fans. Add a monster capturing mechanic, and you've got something that will interest fans both young and old. The kiddie presentation and focus on two young protagonists who act their age might turn off some gamers. Monster management on the field also can be a bit of a pain. If you're pining for old-school Final Fantasy with stellar production values and a big serving of Pokémon, however, this is one world you'll definitely want to visit. 